Welcome to Boardroom and Beyond Podcast, a show dedicated to exploring corporate governance best practice. This podcast is a learning journey, taking us to different parts of the world to discover profound and eye-opening differences in corporate governance, understand those differences, and learn how to unlock the mystery of doing business wherever we go. I'm your host, Lisi Zhang. I hope you will enjoy the journey with me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very special Boardroom and Beyond podcast episode. This episode is to celebrate Governance Magazine's 21st year anniversary. Governance is one of the most influential corporate governance publications with readers around the globe. In the past 21 years, Governance has witnessed and documented the evolution of worldwide corporate governance landscape. And I'm so honored to become one of the regular contributors to this wonderful magazine. Today, I'm very delighted to have the publisher and the owner of Governance Magazine with me on Boardroom and Beyond Podcast to discuss this wonderful 21-year journey of Governance Magazine. Without further ado, please join me to welcome Leslie Stevenson. Hello, Leslie. Welcome to Boardroom and Beyond Podcast. First of all, congratulations for the 21-year anniversary. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Yeah, thank you. Before we start the conversation, may I ask you to introduce yourself to our audience? Of course. And thank you very much for this opportunity, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. I know what you're doing is excellent and you've got a really good following. So I'm humbled by having been invited. I started my career, I was a lawyer by background, I did a law degree, but then didn't fancy going into the law. So I went into legal publishing instead, working for various publishers and ending up with a company at the time was called G Publishing, looking after their list of titles about tax and company regulation. While I was there, we published the first corporate governance code in the UK. I think it's possibly the first code worldwide, which was a Cadbury report on the financial aspects of corporate governance. And we published it on behalf of the London Stock Exchange. Uh, It was the first time I'd ever heard of governance. And then we moved on to, we also published the Greenbury Report, which was on direct remuneration, which caused a lot of interest. I have to say, having been publishing in tax and governance, I wasn't expecting anything exciting, but everyone was so keen to know about what Greenbury was saying about direct remuneration. We had to lock the proofs away every night in the safe because people tried to break into the office, or there was a possibility people might break into the offices to read it. That doesn't happen often in legal publishing. We also published a Hample report, which was a review of the original Cadbury Code, and which was by then known as the Combined Code, and it decided that there wasn't any need for a major change in the existing arrangements. I've also been a member of the International Corporate Governance Network for many years, and they are a great organisation. And as well as governance, I'm the publisher of the Financial Times Board Director Programme, which provides training, development and networking for board directors in their role as director. So the CEO or CFO as a director rather than their functional role, non-executive directors in particular. And in 2011, we introduced the Financial Times Non-Executive Director Diploma, which is the still the only externally accredited qualification for non-executive directors. And we've got 1,420 graduates globally we've had since then. Really, I'm really proud of that. Wow, what an accomplishment. Thank you for the brief introduction. Now let's talk about uh, Governance, the magazine. First, can you uh, help our uh, audience understand maybe a brief introduction of Governance magazine? Like uh, what is the purpose of the magazine? Who are your main audience and the subscribers? Which country do they come from? And, and other than the magazine and the newsletter, monthly magazine and the newsletter, does governance uh, organize any other event, anything regarding the publication? So actually, fully enough, it isn't the 21st anniversary of Governance Magazine. That's actually been going for 23 years, since 1997. It was started by two Financial Times journalists, ironically, considering I now work for the Financial Times as well. And they sold it to G Publishing, which was the publishing house I was working for back then, and it came under my list. G sold it in 2000, and Governance Publishing Information Services Limited was set up on the 31st of May. So that's the anniversary we're we're celebrating. 
I think the original reason they started it was because governance was becoming a more and more important topic and has increased in becoming a more and more important topic over the last 20 years. We cover any issue of relevance to boards and investors. And I always think there's a tension, there, can, there is a tension between boards and investors. But actually, at the end of the day, what they both want is the same thing, which is long term success and sustainability of the organisation. It's just how you go about it. So we don't have any axe to grind on the issuer side or the investor side. We look at it from a point of view of the organisation as a whole. Occasionally, we do look at important developments outside the corporate sector, if something really important has happened in charities or public sector, but mainly our coverage is corporate. We also, we cover, if the coverage is global, and thank you very much for your articles, Lindsay. We, you've, we published, well, the third one is coming out in May in this birthday edition, but we will have done three really good articles from you, and it's been excellent to have that, because I think China is a really interesting place. We're about best practice and governance as a way of offering business advantage, rather than it being merely a tiresome regulation, which has to be complied with. I so do not believe that, so believe in governance as a way an organisation can do better. And our readership, our chairs, chief executive officers, company secretaries in large listed companies worldwide, institutional investors, advisors, business schools and governance professionals. So it's quite a broad range. As to where they come from, although our main readership is in the UK, we've got 50% of our readers in the UK and the USA, we've got 10% in the USA. Um, Our audience is truly global with subscribers and authors in 40 different countries, including Brazil, Canada, Hong Kong, India, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Nigeria, Singapore, so, and the United Arab Emirates. As well as the newsletter, we also run webinars on a night hoc basis. And actually, we did a series of webinars last year with Patrick Dunn, who you've also had as a guest on one of these podcasts, and Alison Gill on governance during the pandemic, and they were very well received. And if anyone wants them, recordings of these can be accessed from free from our website. And we hope to do more in future. And Patrick has also kindly recorded some three minute videos on particular topics like the relationship between the chair and the CEO and um, how to deal with conflict on the board, which are also available free of charge on our website. Wow, thank you. What a, what a journey. 21 years, not many people are really focused on governance, but today it's become top mind of the entire business uh, community. And then for the 20 some years that you are running the governance journey and also involved in this field, can you help us understand how did the COVID governance landscape look like back then in 20 some years ago? I think it was it was obviously very, very different. I remember after we published the Cadbury Code, we decided that there must be an opportunity for a book about corporate governance. And so we did a focus group to find out what we thought the appetite was. And generally, boards were more resistant. They certainly didn't accept it as a concept. And there was a big pushback on, well, this is never going to work because if we disclose all this information, it's going to give far too much information to our competitors, which I thought was quite interesting. And of course, now people just accept, the boards accept that it's the right thing to do. Also interesting, I thought, was in the UK, they launched the weights principles on large governance code for large private companies after the fall of Blip Green and what have you. And I went to a launch event there with some from the FRC and what have you. And the reaction in the room was quite similar to the event I attended 20 years ago, where the private companies were saying, this is just ridiculous. This is too much regulation. We shouldn't have to do this. I thought that was quite interesting, given that Now, I think listed companies take it on board. Whether they do it well or not is another question, but I do think they take it on board. I thought it's quite interesting that all this time in, there was that same level of resistance or emphasis on resistance. The other thing that I think has changed hugely is that at the time, and actually in the Hample report, it talks about the importance of shareholders, that they're the primary recipient of good governance and that their concerns should be of paramount importance. And actually, that has changed completely. It is no longer the shareholder. Yes, they're important. Of course, they're important. But it's broadened out over the last few years to include all stakeholders, which actually 
is enshrined in the 2006 Companies Act in the UK, which I think people possibly forgotten about until they had to start reporting on it a couple of years ago. So it's shareholders, but it's also suppliers, customers, employees, regulators, and the broader environment, the broader community. And I think the other big difference was there was absolutely no concept of board diversity at all, certainly not gender diversity and definitely not on any other level. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. I think this is so important uh, for, you know, today we might not dive deep into the background the history anymore, but for countries who just developing, who are just in the beginning of developing COVID governance code, for a lot of emerging market countries, knowing the history is so important. So I think this will make them feel like, okay, uh, it's not wrong what we're doing. We're just in the beginning of the journey. It's a long way to go. Take time to move to the advanced level. Thank you for sharing this. I'm curious with your 21 year running the governance magazine yourself. What is the most unforgettable moment? Like what is the moment to make you feel like, oh, okay, when you think about the 21 year, that will pump into your mind right away. What are the top challenges? Have you been running into and how did you overcome those challenges? I think, actually, to be honest, one of my top moments was we published um, an article by Alexei Navalny, who's the current obviously opposition leader in Russia. And he wrote an article for us many years ago. And I always remember, I remember meeting him at an ICGN conference. He was great. And he was talking about the difference between well, how you can resolve conflict. And so that, that's my proudest thing, is that I have published an article by Alexei Navalny. In terms of challenges, I think probably juggling time has been the hardest thing, because obviously I'm very busy with the Financial Times Board Director Programme as well. But fortunately, there's a very heavy overlap with subject matter, which makes it easier. We've only got a very small team. We have Kate, who writes our stories for us. Heidi, who does all our administration, runs our website. Charlotte, who does our social media. Cess, who is our sort of proofreading editor and that we've got a chairman Peter who I used to work with at G Publishing and who has given me enormous help on strategy so it's like many organizations it's really important for everyone to be clear about their role and work together one of the things I thought might have been a challenge which actually hasn't turned out to be we're getting enough good content that really hasn't been the case we've been really fortunate there are lots and lots of people out there writing really thoughtful and thought-provoking articles. There's an awful lot of excellent information out there for people who want it. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. I, I'm so glad to know more people uh, contributing, not only just uh, reading the magazine, but contributing the magazine, which makes the magazine like a big network group around the world. Thank you for mentioning about your role as Finance Times non-executive director program. And I'm curious, I think UK is leading the COVID governance journey. You're running the COVID governance magazine the 21 years and working as a publisher for the Finance Time non-executive director program since 2004. I believe you have witnessed that the trend of COVID governance development changes in the UK and other European countries and around the world. What are the top three changes in the past 21 years of companies and for the board directors? And what are the drivers of those changes from your opinion? I think probably the biggest change has been the general acceptance of governance. I mentioned about the focus group in the beginning and people just like, well, this is never going to work. It's not going to be important. It's not going to stick. We're not going to do it. And the acceptance of the governance as being a force for good rather than something just to tick a box on. I mean, in 2000, Cadbury was the first code, as they worldwide. In 2021, the European Corporate Governance Institute, which is a really good site for anyone who's interested in this subject, they put up all the corporate governance codes worldwide and keep them up to date. And I just went in and had a look, quick look through and I counted, well, I stopped counting at 70. So having had one into code, Gore Governance Code in 2000, and now 70, more than 70 from around the world. And the other thing is the approach of investors and their responsibility towards stewardship and their own responsibilities. And on the ECGI website, it lists 19 stewardship codes from around the world. So I think it's just, it's mm -hmm. becoming entrenched in business. It's like you said, Lindsay, people now are aware of it and know it's important. One of the other things is obviously 
broad diversity and inclusion, um, not just gender. Gender's had quite a lot of coverage, but I think people are beginning to understand it's, it's, it's about cognitive diversity. It's not about men and women or anything else. Yes, ethnicity is important, age is important, and you are getting an increasing number of younger board members and increasing the number of companies who are starting up next-gen boards, which I think is a really interesting um, development. Disabled members, people with different sexual orientation and different background, people who can bring a different perspective to the discussion around the board table. That doesn't make it an easy meeting necessarily. You know, it's very easy. If you've all gone to the same kind of school and you come from the same kind of background and you live in the same kind of house, you've probably got the same kind of views, which makes a discussion quite relatively unchallenging. So having this level of diversity on boards can be difficult, but it is a difficulty that is worth having because it changes the way people make decisions. And I already mentioned about the increase in investor stewardship. As When I first got involved in this, I was fortunate enough to meet a man called Alistair ross Gooby, who ran the Hermes Pension Fund, which was to be effectively the British Telecom Pension Fund. And he was so into invest, not activism in the sense of investors making a fuss. It was into dealing with things from the back room, addressing issues they didn't like, but not making them public, not shaming. And he and a man called Peter Butler, who I was also I'm also fortunate enough to know, I think had a huge influence on corporate governance in the UK and worldwide. And they were both instrumental in setting up the International Corporate Governance Network, which, as I say, is an amazing organisation. Mm-hmm. As far as drivers are concerned, I think we started with the scandals. I mean, you know, we all know about Maxwell and BCCI and Polypec, that was back in the 90s. And then we had WorldCom in the 80s and Enron. And then we had Carillion and Patisserie Valerie more recently. And I think it's very sad that these scandals still happen. And it, it does go to show that however much governance has moved on and however much companies are paying it at least more lip service, it isn't really completely embedded. And I think basically, you know, if you've got directors who don't believe in it, then they're not necessarily going to enforce it or see the benefit of enforcing it. I used to think that um, it shows the increasing need of good, experienced directors who know what they're doing, who have integrity, who have understanding, who can work with other people. I think that's really, really important. And of course, you've got the whole social media and internet. So I think the wider public is taking more of an interest than they ever have before on a wide range of topics such as climate change, racism, the Black Lives Matter movement, diversity, and corporate responsibility generally. I think people are voting with their feet. If they think that a company is not behaving ethically, then they won't buy its products. And that focuses your mind quite well as a board. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I was uh, uh, have I, I had a conversation with a guy another day, and he was asking me how, you know, you said, Lindsay, you said that if people don't like it, people just don't invest. But there are still a lot of investors who don't care about it so much for social uh, responsibility. I said, hi, if the investor does, you know, doesn't care, then the customer will care, the supplier will care, the society will care. So eventually everybody has to do good to the society. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing your opinion. And also I want to ask you, now, what do you think will be the, the trend of corporate governance development in the next, let's say, five to 10 years. And what would you suggest companies and the board directors to embrace the upcoming changes? I think that, I mean, five to 10 years is a very long time period now, isn't it? It's changed <laughs> so quickly. Yes. But I think ESG is here to stay, especially with climate change. A little while ago, it used to be called corporate social responsibility, but now people don't talk about CSR, they talk about ESG. And I think we're all aware that something has to be done with climate change and customers are very aware of that. I think there's an extension of this wider sense of stakeholder engagement, which I mentioned earlier, and engaging with a whole range of stakeholders rather than uh, just the shareholders, but equally this the shareholders are taking more responsibility and challenging companies more than they used to, I feel. Culture, I think, is a huge thing, and it's really difficult to measure, and it's really difficult to 
put down classic metrics on it. But everyone, it's like an elephant, isn't it? Everyone knows what yeah. it is, but it's really difficult to describe. But it's really, really important. And people are understanding that culture comes from the top. It's a tone from the top. Obviously, digital technology, AI, and the way we do things. I mean, I don't think you'll ever get completely autonomized board meetings because you couldn't. But there are things AI can do that will help to take away the easier tasks or the easier, the more mundane tasks and free up the board to spend more time on thinking about the future and the strategic developments that they want to do rather than always looking backwards to the financial results and what have you. And as far as what boards need to do, I just guess it's individuals just need to be adaptable and open to change. I mean, who knew just over a year ago that the pandemic was going to happen? Mm -hmm. and how and some companies have adapted really really well and that is about having an open mind and understanding what skills you need on the board what skills you have where you can develop those skills and maybe sometimes you step off and say okay this is not the time for me being on the board someone else would do a better job yeah thank you thank you and with all those changes and also I know you you have been the publisher and uh, almost the main uh, driver for Financial Times Board Director program for the past uh, you know, over the 16 years. What do you see as the necessity and the importance of ongoing corporate governance training for board directors? That's my number one question. Number two is, and what kind of role does governance magazine play for the ongoing board director training? Well, I have, as you kindly mentioned, I have to declare an interest in this because obviously I do run the Financial Times Board Director Programme for them. So obviously I'm going to say, yes, directors should have training. But I do feel really strongly that the role of a director is unique, especially non-executive directors where you don't have direct power. It is about influencing and encouraging and challenging, but in a way that is beneficial to the organisation as a whole of the board. So executive management, when they present a board paper, they don't want to go away and think, well, that was just shut down in flames. If you think it's not right, you have to explain why you think it's not right, question them in a way that gets them to think about, oh, well, actually, maybe next time I could do this better, or, oh, no, that is a good idea, I need to work it on. So it's about collaboration and working together. And I just also think, and I think that applies also to executive directors who sit on the board because you might be the CEO or you might be the CFO or you might be the CIO but your role there is functional when you're sitting around a board table you have to forget not forget that that's probably too strong but you are there to help the board as a whole make the right decisions for the whole organization so the skills are the same and I believe that very passionately and I think Boardroom dynamics are really, really important and having those softer skills. And that's actually why and this is, well, it is a bit of a plug for the FT, but that's why we put so much emphasis on behavioural skills on all the courses we do. It is really, really important. And I also think that every other profession expects specific training and continuing professional development. If you think about doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, surveyors, they all have to get a qualification and they all have to keep themselves up to date. So why would being a good director not be the same? Because the influence, the influence you can have as a director of a company, if you do it well, it's fantastic. If you do it badly, people lose their livelihoods. I think it's really important. And as for how Governance Magazine can help, it basically it helps by keeping them up to date I think you have a responsibility to keep yourself up to date to make sure your skills are okay but also keep yourself up to date with knowledge generally about governance and we keep them up to date with a range of topics and provide insights from governance experts in what's hopefully an easily accessible and interesting way and the website provides a wealth of resources in the way of reports we keep people up to date with forthcoming relevant events hopefully we make it as easy as possible to keep yourself up to date with the important stuff. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, I appreciate that you declare your interest. As myself, I'm a CPA by training, so I understand how important to keep the professional education and uh, not only just attending some formal course, but also keep your eyes on what have been changing. Keep your eyes on the top magazines in the field so you can, you will know what happened in the world, what happened in your field. So I, I'm assuming the philosophy applied to every professional, including board directors. And I think governance serve a good purpose in this field. It's not uh, something people have to 
attend a regular base, but it's something people can read in their casual time, travel time, and to get updated for what happened globally. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leslie. And I want to congratulate you again for your 21-year wonderful journey with Governance Magazine. But I'm not letting you go yet. I have uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, three get to know my guests the questions I like to ask you so my audience can get to know you a little bit more better. My first question is, uh, I want to ask you, where is your favorite place for vacation? Because I know you work so hard. So I want to ask you, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> where's the place you want to go when you have a vacation time? <laughs> um, well, actually, my favourite place is actually Scotland. Um, my partner's from Scotland, and so we've got family up there. And just every time I go, it is so beautiful. The scenery is stunning. The people are absolutely lovely. I'm quite into history, mm-hmm. and there is just masses of it. There's great local food. I don't know if your audience will be aware of the concept of the deep fried Mars bar that originated in Stonehaven, but it's Uh much better than deep fried Mars bars. Let me tell you, they have some fantastic fish, fantastic meat and vegetables. The only thing about Scotland is the weather's not always that good, but we've had some fantastic times up there. We were up on the Isle of Mull and it could have been Mediterranean. The sea was so blue. We were driving down this road, which is like this one road that goes around Mull, and there was an eagle sat in the middle of the road and we had stopped for it because it decided it wasn't ready to move on yet. Just stunning, stunning place. Love it, Scotland. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, by running this show, asking, have conversation with my guests, I'm putting more and more place to my to-go list. So I will make uh, Scotland another place I have to go in my lifetime. And yeah, and uh, my next question is, uh, I know you have been living in uh, London, working in London. For people who never been to London, can you recommend three places in London if people want to experience how local London people live? Well, there, I mean, there are so many places in London, but one, three of my favourites are uh-huh. there's the V&A Museum of Childhood, which is in Bethnal Green in East London, which is like a series of rooms through the ages. And it just gives you a really good feel for how children grew up and the society that they grew up in and what they did throughout the ages. Another museum, um, which I apologies, but this is also really, really good, is the Hornimy Museum and Gardens in Forest Hill, which is a fantastic collection of really eclectic exhibits from around the world. So it's not really that London focused, but I believe I'm right, I haven't checked this, but I believe I'm right in saying they were collected by Thomas Lipton, who was a tea trader and I hope he wasn't a slaver, I don't know. Um, but mm-hmm. it is just, it is an incredible one. And then there's gardens as well. It's its lovely and Forest Hill's a nice part of the world. And then finally, I would just say go to one of the parks, not just mm-hmm. the big well-known ones like Kew Gardens or Richmond, but there are loads of smaller parks like Burgess Park, Brockwell Park, Dulwich Woods, all around. And that is where Londoners go and relax and walk around and you get a bit of greenery and it's, just absolutely lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I know most of my, a, a lot of my audience is from United States, from Canada, and I do have a lot, I do have some uh, audience, part of the audience from uh, European countries. So I think sharing uh, the best place in London will help my audience find out what, you know, how London people live over there if they ever uh, interested in. My last question I always like to ask, this is so inspiring for me too. Can you name one individual who inspired you most in your life? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of people who've inspired me. You know, there's the obvious ones like Mandela and what have you, Hugh, Greta Thunberg. But the person I think, the main person, is my mother. Um, She was a real inspiration in everything she did. She was originally a nurse. She had a real strong sense of integrity and truthfulness sense of her responsibility to the community and helping other people and her caring attitude towards everyone she came across will just always be with me and she definitely my inspiration Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting I interviewed uh, a lot of honorable guests and I I say at least half of my guests uh, uh, share the most inspiring people is their family member. Yeah, and a lot of, lot of most of them is the mother or you know father, grandfather. I think the family culture, family tree really means a lot to to, to us as an individual. 
Thank you for sharing this. Congratulations for the magazine for the 21 year. I hope the bright future for governance magazine and for governance in the globe. And looking forward to working with you on various projects in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been an honor. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening Boardroom and Beyond podcast episode. Please follow us on LinkedIn, Apple, Spotify, or whenever you are listening now for future episodes. I would love to know your questions on this journey. Please leave comments or share your ideas. They will inspire me for future episodes. Also, please check our website at boardroomandbeyond.com for show notes, takeaways, and more. I've been your host, Lindsay Zhang. Thanks again for listening.